The Lion and the Mouse, based on a fable by Aesop. How can the lion and the mouse get along in the jungle? One afternoon, a lion was napping in the jungle. Nearby, a tiny mouse was searching the ground for food. The lion opened one eye and watched the mouse. Well, hello, little mouse," said the lion. "You will make a tasty afternoon snack." The mouse froze in fear. She was too close to the lion's great claws to escape. "Pardon me, great king lion," said the mouse. "I am sorry to wake you. I promise that if you do not eat me, I will help you some day." The lion roared with laughter. "How will you ever be able to help me? You are small and weak, and I am the king of the jungle." "I will show you," said the brave mouse. "If you let me go, you will see that a tiny friend can be the best friend of all." "I find that hard to believe," said the lion, "but I will let you go." You are a very lucky mouse today, and with that, the mouse hurried away. A few weeks later, the mouse was leaving her den when she heard the sound of a roaring lion. Something about the lion's roar made the mouse worry. She rushed toward the sound as fast as she could. From a safe spot behind a tree, the mouse peeked into the clearing. And saw the lion who had spared her life. The lion was caught in a net. He was roaring with all his might and struggling to break free. The mouse ran into the clearing. Great King Lion, what is the problem? She asked. I am caught in a trap, cried the lion. I will never run free again. I am your friend. Do you remember me? said the mouse. You spared my life, so now I will rescue you. I will help you solve your problem. I told you before, said the lion to the mouse. I don't believe that a tiny creature like you could ever help me. Just trust me and try to sit still, said the mouse. I have a plan. The lion lay down on the ground with his big head between his paws. "I'll try anything," he said. Right away, the mouse hopped onto the net, grasped a piece of rope in her front paws, and chewed it in half. Then she chewed through another piece of rope, and another, and another. Finally, she had made a hole big enough for the lion to escape. I'm free! Yelled the lion. He leaped into the air and reached out to the mouse for a hug. You really are a good friend, the lion said. You were right. We may be very different, but we can still depend on each other. The happy lion walked out of the jungle with his new friend. He even gave the tiny mouse a ride. They talked about all of their favorite things. As they talked, they realized that they were similar in many ways. Let's spend some more time together," said the lion. "Look, the sun is about to set. There is a hill just across the river with a pretty view of the setting sun. I know just the hill you are talking about," said the mouse. "I like to watch the sunset from that hill too." So the lion and the mouse set off together to climb the hill. Each day after that, they met at the top of their favorite hill to watch the sunset together. Before long, they could not imagine a time when they had not been friends. We can help. Every school day is a busy day. There is work to do. And there are games to play. Everyone can work, and everyone can play too. Trina can help start the day. The teacher is busy saying good morning. 
Trina holds the door open for her classmates. Tim can help everyone learn. The teacher opens a box of books. Tim hands them out, one book to each classmate. Sue can help clean up. The teacher carries the paint pots to the sink. Sue carries the paint brushes. Jake can help on the playground. The teacher unlocks the shed door. Jake wheels out the cart of playground balls. Now everyone can play. The Three Sisters Long ago, there lived three sisters. They lived with their father, a farmer, and helped him farm his vegetables. One day, the oldest sister said, I am father's favorite because I am the strongest. I can pick vegetables faster than both of you. Her sisters were upset. The second sister said, No, I am father's favorite. I am the best at planting seeds. Without me, the vegetables would not grow. The youngest sister cried out, I am the funniest. Without my stories and jokes to pass the time, the days in the field would drag on forever. I am father's favorite. Their father had been listening in the other room. He came in and said, My daughters, everything you have said is true. I need each of you because you are all special in your own way. I love you all the same amount, and I love you all very, very much. After that, the daughters never argued about who was their father's favorite. The Ugly Duckling Based on a Tale by Hans Christian Andersen What do baby ducks look like? How do they act? How are they different from grown-up ducks? Mother Duck sat on her eggs. She waited and waited. Suddenly, Something moved. The eggs were beginning to hatch. One by one, the ducklings pushed out of their fragile shells. One by one, the ducklings looked at their mother for the first time. Mother Duck looked at them, too. Most of the ducklings were small, yellow, and fuzzy. But one duckling looked different. That duckling was bigger than the others. His feathers were gray, and his neck was long. I have never seen a duckling like you, my dear, Mother Duck said. You are certainly different, but I love you just the same. Follow me, sweet ducklings, Mother Duck said. Then she hopped in the pond, and the ducklings followed. Mr. and Mrs. Frog saw the ducks swim by. The two frogs were the proud parents of new baby tadpoles. Mother Duck's new ducklings are as cute as our tadpoles, except for that last one, said Mrs. Frog. You're right, said Mr. Frog. That is an ugly duckling. Mother Duck led the ducklings away. She did not want the ducklings to hear what the frog said, but it was too late. The gray duckling had heard the frogs. Is it true, Mother? Am I an ugly duckling? He asked. You are beautiful, Mother Duck said. You are big and strong, and you will surely do well. I am proud of all my ducklings. Don't listen to those silly frogs. The gray duckling wanted to believe Mother Duck, but it was hard. Everywhere he went, the animals reminded him that he was strange. What an odd duck, they said. The gray duckling was sad. The other ducklings never invited him to play with them. He was alone. There must be something wrong with me, thought the gray duckling. I do not belong. That night, while the duck family was sleeping, the gray duckling quietly wandered away. He floated down a stream. He saw many new places. He gathered information about other animals and the world around him. But this did not help him. He still felt alone. Then one day, he saw a group of beautiful white swans with long necks flying in the sky. What beautiful birds, thought the gray duckling. 
If only I could fly away, maybe I could find a home where I belong. The air grew chilly as fall came. Then it was winter. The ponds and streams froze. The gray duckling was often hungry and cold. At last, winter became spring. One day, the duckling saw several beautiful white swans splashing in a distant pond. They were the same birds with long necks he had seen flying months before. I want to swim and play too, he thought. I don't want to be alone anymore. The duckling stretched his wings. He felt stronger and bigger than before. Without even trying, he flew into the air. It felt wonderful to fly. The duckling flew to the pond and the white swans gathered around him. I know I am ugly and different, started the duckling. You are not ugly, said one of the swans. You are beautiful. We are here to welcome you. The duckling looked at his reflection in the water, and for the first time he saw that they were right. He was a beautiful white swan, just like them. At last he had found the place where he belonged. The Tortoise and the Hare Based on a Fable by Aesop How do the tortoise and the hare move? Tomorrow will be the first day of school for the forest animals. Henry Hare was eager to start. He told his friend Tommy Tortoise that he would be the fastest one at school. Look at me go, he bragged, doing high hops from tree to tree. No one can catch me. I'll be the first one at school. Tommy Tortoise sighed. It was true. Henry's movement was fast while Tommy crawled very, very slowly. Tommy inched toward the tree while Henry hopped in circles around him. I know, said Tommy. Let's have a race to see who gets to school first. Then we will know who is the faster animal. Henry laughed. Okay, Tommy, I will race you. It will be easy to win because I hop quickly and you crawl slowly. The next morning, Tommy and Henry met at the starting line for their race. Henry could not wait to begin. He hopped quickly from one side of the road to the other, while Tommy crawled very slowly to the starting line. Henry laughed. Are you sure you want to race, Tommy? You know I'll win. You crawl so slowly, and it's a long way to school. You'll be exhausted after just a few minutes. I don't know about that, said Tommy. I may surprise you. Everyone came to watch the race and cheer for Henry and Tommy. Their parents stood by the starting line and helped them get ready. Freddy Fox agreed to start the race. He looked down at his watch and then shouted, Ready, set, go! Henry quickly hopped across the starting line, racing past his friend. Soon, Henry was far ahead of Tommy. He hopped faster and faster until he reached the halfway mark and became too tired to go on. He looked around and noticed his favorite flowers growing near the side of the road. Then he saw his friend Sam standing nearby, watching the race. Henry looked behind him, but he couldn't see Tommy. Tommy is so slow he'll never catch up to me, he thought. I can rest here for a while and I'll still win. So Henry decided to rest his legs and talk to Sam before finishing the race. Meanwhile, Tommy crawled at his slow but steady pace. The race was so exciting that he didn't feel exhausted. When he arrived at the halfway mark, he didn't notice Henry talking to Sam on the side of the road. Henry didn't notice Tommy either. Tommy kept crawling toward the finish line while Henry talked and talked. Suddenly, Henry remembered the race. He looked around, but he didn't see Tommy anywhere. He must still be far behind, Henry thought. I'm going to hop to school and win. He said goodbye to Sam and zoomed off down the road. As Henry hopped ahead, he saw his parents and friends standing and cheering in front of the school. 
but they weren't cheering for him. They were cheering for Tommy. He was already across the finish line. Tommy waited for Henry to finish the race. Then Henry sadly hopped over to his friend. You were right, Tommy, he said. I moved faster, but you still won. You kept going while I stopped to look at the flowers and talk to Sam. Tommy smiled at his friend, and they walked into school together. What a fun adventure, said Tommy. It's good to be fast, but sometimes slow and steady wins the race. Tiki Tiki Tembo, based on a Chinese fable. Long ago, two boys were born in a small village in China. Their parents named their firstborn son Tiki Tiki Tembo, No Serembo, Mary Berry, Tip Top, Silly Billy, Flip Flop, Bush Berry, Bembo. When their second son was born, they had one favorite name left Chen. At last, the brothers were old enough to play outside by themselves, but their mother warned them. Do not go near the deep well, or you will trip and fall in. One day, when the brothers were chasing a kite, Chen tripped and fell into the well. Splash! His older brother raced to tell their mother what had happened. Mother, mother, Chen's brother cried. Chen has fallen into the well. We must rescue him, cried his mother. Run and find the house painter. Tell him to come quickly and bring his long ladder. So the young boy raced to the village and found the house painter, who was standing on top of his long ladder. Chen has fallen into a deep well, he cried, and only your long ladder can save him. Together, they ran back to the well. Then the house painter climbed down his long ladder into the water. When he came back up again, he was carrying Chen. After that, the brothers did not play near the well for a long time. But one day, Tiki Tiki Tembo, No Serembo, Mary Berry, Tip Top, Silly Billy, Flip Flop, Bush Berry Bembo ran to catch a ball. He jumped high in the air and fell right into the well. Down, down, down he went. Splash went the water. Chen ran to tell his mother. Mother, mother, he cried. Tiki Tiki Tembo, No Serembo, Mary Berry, Tip Top, Silly Billy, Flip Flop, Bush Berry Bembo has fallen into the well. But his mother couldn't believe her ears. What did you say? Tell me again. So Chen took a deep breath and said, Tiki Tiki Tembo, No Serembo, Mary Berry Tip Top, Silly Billy Flip Flop, Bush Berry Bembo has fallen into the well. We must rescue him right away, Chen's mother said. Quick, find the house painter. Tell him to bring his long ladder. So Chen raced to the village to find the house painter. By the time he found him, he could barely speak. Oh, honorable house painter, Chen cried. Tiki, Tiki, Mary, Barry. Chen stopped and took a very deep breath. Then he started again. Tiki, Tiki, Tembo, Bush, Flip, Hop. Chen stopped and started to cry. He could not say his brother's long name. What are you trying to tell me? asked the house painter. This time, Chen took a very, very deep breath and said, Tiki Tiki Tembo, No Serembo, Mary Berry Tip Top, Silly Billy Flip Flop, Bush Berry Bembo has fallen into the well. What? cried the house painter. Why didn't you say so at once? We must save him right away. So Chen and the house painter ran to the well. The house painter used his tall ladder to climb down to the bottom. Soon, he climbed up, carrying Tiki Tiki Tembo, No Serembo, Mary Berry Tip Top, Silly Billy Flip Flop Bush Berry Bembo. Because of his long name, the boy had been in the water much longer than had his brother Chen. He had to rest in bed for several days. When he opened his eyes, ready to play again, his parents were sitting next to him, smiling. We have something to tell you, they said. From now on, we will call you only by your first three names. And so, from that day on, he was known only as Tiki Tiki Tembo.
A feast of the senses. How can your senses help you prepare a feast? The kitchen is one of the most popular rooms in any home. This is because the smells, sights, and sounds from a kitchen tell us that we are about to eat. In Latino cultures, people celebrate special events with a feast. It can take days to prepare all the food. Many people start learning to cook at a young age. They use all five of their senses smell, touch, sight, hearing, and taste to become good cooks. Learning to cook takes some practice. Get ready for a feast of the senses. Which sense do you think we will use first? When you cook, your sense of smell is very important. Good cooks smell different spices, such as pepper and cinnamon, to figure out what flavors go together best. Your sense of smell and touch tell you when food is fresh. When you shop for a fruit or vegetable, you smell it and feel it to make sure that it is ripe. For instance, if a lime is too hard, it is not ripe enough. If it is very soft, it is probably too ripe. If it smells fresh and feels firm, you will want to buy it. Your sense of touch tells you when food is ready to be put in the oven. As you can see, a woman is making bread for the Latino feast. As she works the dough with her hands, it feels tough and lumpy at first. Then, after she kneads it more, it feels soft and smooth. Her sense of touch tells her that the bread is ready to bake. Sizzle! Fresh onions are poured into a hot frying pan. Blub, blub, blub. A pot of soup simmers on the stove. Ding! The oven timer goes off. Cooks are always using their sense of hearing. Different sounds tell them what is happening to the food as it cooks. The sounds of cooking also tell cooks when to begin the next step in the recipe. When the sizzle of the onions turns into a soft hiss, the onions are cooked. Sight is another helpful sense in the kitchen. Raw onions are white or yellow, while cooked onions are clear. Sight is also very helpful to bakers. For example, when a baker looks in the oven, she can see that the dough has risen and turned brown. The bread is finished baking. Your five senses give you information about your cooking all the time. All you have to do is pay attention. Now it's time for the sense you have probably been waiting for. Taste. After all, eating is all about enjoying the taste of food, right? Here's a special secret about cooking. When you prepare a feast, you get to taste the meal along the way. Cooks use their sense of taste to test the flavors of the foods as they cook. That way, they can add more spices, cook a dish for a bit longer, or make other changes to the recipe. Finally, it's time for the feast to begin. The guests are hungry. They are eager to explore all the different kinds of food. If the cooks used all of their senses well in the kitchen, everyone will be happy. Kindergartners can. Look at these kindergarten children. What do you think these children did as soon as they got to class? Yes, you are right. The first thing they did was to put away their bags and coats. Now they are sitting in a reading circle. They listen to their teacher as she reads them a new book. While she reads, the children look at the pictures. Then the teacher and children talk about the book together. All of the children have questions about the story. Everyone wonders what will happen next. Learning about new books is one of the many different things these children can do in kindergarten. 
Kindergartners can grow things. Now the children work together to grow plants for a class garden. Everyone has a special job to do for this project. Some children carefully bury tiny seeds in the soil. Others water the plants each week. Water helps the plants grow tall and strong. The class wants to find out how much the plants grew. So the children will measure the plants with a ruler. These plants are growing fast. Now everyone will put the plants near a sunny window. The plants need lots of sun. The kindergartners care for the plants all year. It is an important job. How tall will the plants grow? Kindergartners can play together in the school playground. It's fun to jump rope with your friends. Each person takes a turn. Other children stand in a circle and play catch. It feels good to be outside on a warm afternoon. Some kindergartners play soccer. One player kicks the ball. Whoosh! It sails through the air. Who will run and kick it next? No one wants the game to end. Now it's time to go back inside. When playtime ends, the children put away their jump ropes and balls. Then they get in line and walk back inside the school together. Soon they will meet a special visitor. Kindergartners can learn about community helpers too. A police officer visits the school today. Officer Becker tells the children all about his job. He explains how he helps keep everyone safe. He reminds the children to obey all the traffic signs and to listen to their teacher. The children ask him many questions. They want to know what it is like to work in a police station. What is it like to drive a police car? After the police officer leaves, the children work together to write a class thank you note. They hope that he will come back to visit their classroom again soon. There is so much to do in kindergarten. What do you think you will learn this year? Timimoto, a tale from Japan. How do tools help Timimoto explore? Many years ago, in a small village in Japan, an old woman and her husband were talking about their life's wishes. I have only one wish, said the woman. I am sad that we never had children. I wish that we could have a child, even if he were no bigger than my finger. The old man nodded his head and sighed. Later that day, the woman took her bucket to go fetch some water. She was walking along when she heard a cry coming from the ground next to the path. She looked down and saw a tiny baby, only one inch long, wrapped in a piece of red cloth. My wish has come true, cried the woman. She picked up the baby and cradled him in her arms. Filled with joy, she brought the baby home to her husband. They named him Timimoto. Timimoto grew up, but he never grew very tall. When he was 15 years old, he only stood as high as his mother's middle finger. On the day of his 15th birthday, Timimoto decided that he wanted to see the world. I am going on a journey, he announced. We understand, son, said the old man. We, too, wanted to explore the world when we were younger. Let us give you some tools for your journey. The old woman fetched a sewing needle, slid it into a piece of straw, and tied it to Timimoto's belt. You will need a sword to protect yourself, she said. The old man went to the kitchen. He returned with a rice bowl and a chopstick. And you will need a boat and a paddle, he said to Timimoto. You can get far if you travel on the river. Thank you, said Timimoto. These tools will help me as I explore new places. Timimoto said goodbye to his parents. Be safe, they said to him. Watch out for the night giant who lives down the river. Timimoto hopped in his boat and paddled away. Timimoto set out on his adventure to discover the world. As he was paddling along, 
he felt something sticky tap his shoulder. He turned and saw a huge frog on a rock behind his boat. The frog was trying to catch him with its tongue. Wait, thought Timimoto. I have the perfect tool for this. He raised his chopstick high in the air and whacked the frog on the nose. The frog dived into the water and swam away. Later, Timimoto arrived at a small village. He saw a crowd of people running toward their houses. He got out of his boat and walked into the village. He spoke to a man who was pushing a cart of vegetables. Excuse me, sir, why is everybody running? he asked. The man looked down and said, You must be new in town, young man. Hasn't anybody told you about the giant who comes out at sunset? Suddenly, Timimoto remembered what his parents had told him. This must be where the night giant lives, he thought. Timimoto thanked the man and raced back to his boat. Timimoto ran toward the dock, but it was too late. The sun had already set behind a hill. What would happen next? Suddenly, the ground started to rumble and shake. The night giant appeared behind poor Timimoto. I am hungry for a big dinner, the giant roared. You are very small, but you'll do for my first bite. The giant scooped up Timimoto and popped him in its mouth. Inside the giant's mouth, Timimoto knew just what to do. Mother gave me this sword for a reason, he thought. Timimoto lifted the sword high above his head and brought it down on the giant's tongue. The giant let out a terrible scream. Timimoto leaped out of the giant's mouth and landed safely on the ground. That hurt, the giant cried. I will never return to this village again, he whined as he ran back into the forest. One by one, the townspeople came out of their houses and surrounded Timimoto. You have defeated the night giant, they cheered. Thank you, friend. Timimoto bowed his head, then got into his boat and paddled toward home. Kites in flight. What different shaped kites do you see around you? Go anywhere in the world on a windy day, and you might see kites floating high in the sky. People have been flying kites for many years. Some people fly kites for fun. Other people fly kites to celebrate special holidays. Even scientists fly kites. They use kites to learn more about nature and changes in weather. Kites can be different shapes. Some kites are shaped like squares or circles. Others are shaped like rectangles. There are even kites shaped like animals. Kites are often very colorful. Sometimes people paint pictures on their kites. Every year there is a big kite festival in Washington State. Kite flyers from all over the world bring their kites to this special event. There are contests to see which kites are the most beautiful and other contests to see which kites make the most amazing movements in the sky. Kite flying is a popular activity in India, especially during different festivals throughout the year. People fly their kites from rooftops or in open fields. In India, many of the kites are shaped like diamonds and are very colorful. Some kites are made from materials such as bamboo, which is a type of grass that grows in India. These kites are then covered with a very thin paper. This makes the kite very light and easy to fly. Many people in India play games together with their kites as the kites float in the air. You win the game if you keep your kite up in the air the longest. Every year, children in India have fun playing games with their kites. Many people believe that the first kite was made in China thousands of years ago. Today, people in China still enjoy flying kites. Some kites are simple, while others have many parts and details. Kite flyers can use a flat kite. A flat kite is made of simple shapes, such as two flat squares. These kites are very colorful. 
people decorate these kites with designs showing important scenes in Chinese history. Other kites in China look like bugs, such as butterflies and dragonflies, which have wings. Some kites are even shaped like fish or birds. Many kites in China are made from bamboo and covered with silk, a thin, smooth material. People paint pictures on the silk to add decoration to their kites. In South America, the country of Brazil has a long history of kite flying. People fly kites that look like spinning tops. The kites are very colorful and are used in games. These kites usually have five sides with a rectangle on the bottom and a triangle on top. Can you count the five sides on the kite in the picture? People in Brazil make their own kites at home. They use wood to make the frame and thin tissue paper to make the kite. Some people paint the flag of Brazil on their kites. Others even add pictures of one of the country's soccer teams. You can see that people all around the world enjoy flying kites. Kites can be many shapes, colors, and sizes. Which kite is your favorite? From Caterpillar to Butterfly What do you know about butterflies? Many baby animals look a lot like their parents. A baby colt grows up to be a horse. A little cub grows up to be a bear. Do you know what a caterpillar grows up to be? If you said a butterfly, then you are right. A caterpillar looks nothing like its parents. How do caterpillars grow and change into beautiful butterflies? What is the process every butterfly goes through? A butterfly goes through four stages or steps in its life. Let's observe each stage. The first stage is the egg. Some butterflies lay eggs in groups. But the monarch butterfly lays just one egg at a time. The mother butterfly lays her eggs on plants. Her babies will eat the plants when they hatch. After about a week, the second stage begins. The caterpillar hatches from the egg. It is small and slender. It looks like a worm. The caterpillar is only as long as your fingernail. The caterpillar eats a lot and grows quickly. First, it eats its own eggshell. Then, it feeds on plant leaves. The caterpillar uses its strong jaws to munch on the leaves. It uses other parts of its mouth to smell and taste the food. As the caterpillar grows, it molts or sheds its skin. This happens four or five times. After a few weeks, the caterpillar has reached its full size. Now it is ready for the next stage, stage three. The third stage is called the pupa. First, the caterpillar attaches itself to a plant. Next, it forms a hard case around itself. The case is called a chrysalis, or a cocoon. The chrysalis keeps the caterpillar safe as it gets ready for the final stage. The pupa stage lasts for many weeks. If you look closely at the pupa, you wouldn't see anything happening. But there is a lot going on inside the chrysalis. The caterpillar is changing and growing. It is becoming a butterfly. Stage 4 is the last stage. An adult butterfly pushes through the chrysalis and crawls out. At first, the butterfly rests for a while. It is tired and weak, and its wings are still wet. If you are curious, you can watch the butterfly from a safe distance. You can see the beautiful colors on its wings. Finally, the butterfly's wings dry in the sun. It flies away to look for food. After a few weeks, the butterfly is ready to mate. Then she looks for the right plant and lays her eggs. The process begins all over again. The Boy Who Cried Wolf Based on a Fable by Aesop 
Does the boy follow the rules that Tio Pablo gave him? Long ago, in a village on the grassy plains of Mexico, a boy named Gabriel reached his 15th birthday. Gabriel was bursting with excitement. He had waited for this day for many months. His uncle, Tio Pablo, was going to show him how to guard the village sheep. At noon, when the sun was high in the sky, Tio Pablo finally arrived. Feliz cumpleaños, Gabriel, said Tio Pablo. Happy birthday. I have come to give you a special gift. You are now old enough to be one of our village shepherds. Come with me and I will show you what to do. Gabriel and Tio Pablo walked out into the fields. The village sheep grazed peacefully on the long, wavy grass. Tio Pablo explained to Gabriel, Your job is to stand on this hill and guard the sheep. Shepherds have two important rules to follow. Rule number one, if you see a wolf, cry out for help right away. Rule number two, never cry wolf unless you actually see one. Of course, Tio Pablo, Gabriel said eagerly. That's easy. I can follow those rules. Tio Pablo went back to the village. Gabriel stood in the sun and watched the sheep. He looked way, way out across the plain, but there were no wolves. After a little while, Gabriel thought to himself, This is boring. It's too quiet out here. It's time for some action. Just once, I want to see what happens if I cry wolf. So Gabriel cupped his hands to his mouth and cried, Wolf! Wolf! Men and women came running from the village. They rushed up the hill, still carrying the tools from their morning chores. But there was no wolf. The sheep were safely grazing, as usual. Gabriel laughed and laughed. The villagers did not laugh. Tio Pablo frowned. Remember rule number two, he reminded Gabriel. The villagers walked away. Gabriel went back to guarding the sheep. He looked way, way out across the plain, but there were no wolves to be seen. Gabriel sighed. This is getting boring again, he thought. It was fun to see how fast Tio Pablo and the others ran when I called them. I think I'll play my prank just one more time. So he did. Wolf! Wolf! Gabriel cried. It's coming toward the sheep. All the villagers rushed back out to the field. But once again, there was no wolf. There was no danger at all. Gabriel giggled. But no one else seemed to enjoy his prank. Tio Pablo shook his head. You must learn to cooperate, Gabriel, he said. And I don't think you understand the importance of rule number two. Gabriel felt bad. Lo siento, Tio Pablo. I'm sorry. I will follow the rules now, he promised. Gabriel was alone with the sheep again. He looked way, way out across the plain, but... Wait! What was that? Gabriel saw a dark speck coming toward the sheep. It crept closer, closer, and closer still. It was a wolf, a real wolf with pointed ears and a pointed black nose. Wolf! Wolf! Gabriel cried. The sheep scattered, but nobody came to help. Nobody even looked in Gabriel's direction. Wolf! Wolf! There's really a wolf this time! Gabriel called desperately. At last, one of the farmers working nearby turned to look. Wolf! he cried to the others. Once again, the villagers rushed to help Gabriel. They chased the wolf away, just in time. The sheep were safe. 
As the villagers walked away, Tio Pablo came up to Gabriel. I hope you have learned to follow the rules of a responsible shepherd, he said. Yes, Tio, Gabriel exclaimed. If I want people to trust what I say, I must tell the truth. From now on, I will only cry wolf when I mean it. The Turtle and the Flute, a tale from Brazil. What are the different sounds that these animals hear in the jungle? Long ago, on the banks of the Amazon River, a happy little turtle played her flute all day. She played joyful music that made all the animals sway and hum. They gathered every day to listen. Macaw squawked, I can talk and talk all day, but I'd rather listen to you play, turtle. I agree, croaked Toad as he swayed to the music on his lily pad. Your music is the nicest in the jungle. Turtle also loved to dance to the music as she played. She leaped around on the jungle floor, hopping and jumping from flower to flower. Taper whistled as Turtle played and danced, while Macaw sang along to the lovely song. One day, after Turtle had played and danced for hours, she was very tired. I think it is time to rest. Good night, my friends, she said as she yawned. After her friends waved goodbye, Turtle curled up inside her shell with her flute tucked in beside her. Soon she was fast asleep. After a few hours, a man walked by. He looked down and saw Turtle sleeping on the riverbank. He decided to take her home. He looked around to make sure nobody was watching. He picked her up and exclaimed, Yum! Turtle soup will make a tasty treat for dinner tonight. The man carefully carried Turtle home. He put her in a sturdy cage in his yard and then closed the lid tightly. His children were playing nearby. They ran over to the cage to see what was inside. Don't let the turtle out of the cage, the man said to them. Tonight we will enjoy delicious turtle soup for our dinner. Then the man went to work in the fields. The children stayed home and played in the yard. Every once in a while, they would peek into the cage at the little turtle. They started to chat about the yummy turtle soup they would have for dinner later. When Turtle woke up, she knew she was not in a familiar place. She was surprised to find herself locked in a cage. She became very frightened when she heard the children say, Turtle Soup. I must escape, she thought. She pushed and pulled on the lid of the cage, but it wouldn't budge. Then she had an idea. Turtle reached for her flute and began to play. She played the most beautiful music that she knew. The children stopped to listen. Listen, Turtle is playing the flute, they shouted. They ran over to the cage and watched Turtle play. They began to sway to the beautiful music. I can dance as well as play, said Turtle. I can even play and dance at the same time. If you open the cage, I will show you. The children opened the cage, and Turtle started to dance. Turtle's shell banged against the sides of the cage as she danced. The volume of the flute became louder. The children laughed and clapped. I am stiff from dancing in this tiny cage, Turtle stopped and said. Please, let me go for a short walk. The children wanted Turtle to entertain them more, so they let her out. May I try your flute, the boy asked. I would love to play beautiful music, too. As the boy played, Turtle crawled away. Don't go too far, his sister warned. Turtle crawled around the yard as the children took turns playing the flute. Soon, the children stopped watching and Turtle crawled closer to the forest. Then, she quietly disappeared under a pile of leaves. The children suddenly looked up and noticed that Turtle was gone. Turtle! Turtle! they called. Where are you? But there was no answer. Turtle tricked us, they said. By the time the man returned home from the fields, Turtle was far away, 
sitting on the banks of the river once again, playing happy tunes on her new flute. Field trips. What places do you go to with your class? Have you ever been on a field trip? A field trip is a special outing to a place in your community, such as a zoo or a local museum. You might go on a field trip with your class or with a club or team. Field trips are a fun way to change your everyday routine. They also help you learn about different places in your community. A state park is an exciting place to visit on a field trip. In a state park, you can walk through a forest, go boating on a lake, or go for a hike. The people in charge of state parks are called rangers. The rangers can teach you about local plants, animals, rocks, and historical buildings. There are many outdoor activities you can enjoy at a state park. Do you like sharks, dolphins, and other underwater creatures? If you answered yes, then you'd love a field trip to an aquarium. Many aquariums have exhibits about animals and plants that live in the local waters. You can learn about the fish that you have seen in rivers and lakes. If you live near the ocean, you can learn about the shells and seaweed that wash up on the beach. A fun part of any field trip to an aquarium is a special show with large sea animals, such as dolphins or seals. These animals are very intelligent. Their trainers teach them to leap, twirl, and perform tricks. If you are lucky, an aquarium worker will give you a special tour. She can show you how the animals are fed, how their tanks are cleaned, and how they are cared for when they get sick. Field trips are a good way to learn about interesting jobs. You might discover that you want to work at an aquarium someday. If you think working with sea animals would be fun, what about fighting fires? Another exciting field trip is a tour of a local fire station. In many communities, people volunteer to fight fires to help keep people in their town safe. At the firehouse, firefighters will show you their trucks, uniforms, and other equipment. You might even get to sit in a fire truck. Firefighters cooperate with other workers in the community. Often, they work together with police officers. Community helpers share facts that will keep everyone safe. Firefighters also work with animal rescue workers to help save dogs and cats. You will learn how quickly firefighters get ready when someone calls about a fire or emergency. After a tour of the firehouse, you will know what to do if there is a fire or emergency. How do you get your mail every day? What happens to a letter after you drop it in a mailbox? What's a zip code anyway? You can find out the answers to all of these questions and more when you take a field trip to a local post office. During your field trip, you'll learn how a piece of mail gets from one place to another. First, a post office worker weighs the letter or package. Then, the customer pays for the stamps. Next, other workers sort the letters and packages and load them onto trucks. Finally, the carriers deliver the mail to your house. When you are on a field trip, it is important to ask questions. Adults are there to teach you about their jobs. Do you wonder how many post office workers work together to deliver all the mail to your neighborhood? Do you know how much money it costs to send a letter? Now is your chance to ask. Little Juan and the Cooking Pot, a tale from Puerto Rico. What tools does little Juan's mother use to cook? Once there was a boy named little Juan who lived with his mother. Like many children, little Juan liked to play more than he liked to work. One day, little Juan was playing ball in the backyard. His mother came to find him. Little Juan, I am making a big stew for dinner. Please go over to your grandmother's house and borrow her big pot and cooking utensils. Little Juan stopped playing and frowned at his mother. 
Do I have to go to Abuela Carmen's house? I want to play ball. Mama sighed. If you want dinner, you must go right now, little one. You can play ball another time. Oh, all right, said little Juan as he dropped his ball and walked slowly to the house. Little Juan ran up the hill and down the hill all the way to Abuela Carmen's house. He pushed open the door and went to the kitchen. Delicious smells filled the room. Little Juan loved Abuela Carmen's kitchen. She always wore her chef uniform when she cooked. An apron and her big chef's hat. She worked as a chef for people in town, so she had a great variety of cooking equipment. Abuela Carmen smiled as little Juan came in and asked to borrow her big pot. Hello, little Juan, she said. You may borrow my pot, but please take good care of it. She also handed him a large spoon, a spatula, A pan, a measuring cup, and a pot holder. Little Juan put all of these things inside of the pot. Are you sure you can carry all of those things, little Juan? They're quite heavy, said Abuela. Don't worry, Abuela, said little Juan. I can do it. Then little Juan left and headed home with a heavy pot filling his arms. Soon, little Juan was very tired of carrying the pot. He set it on the ground and sat down next to it. He studied the pot closely and counted its legs. Pot, you have three legs, and I have only two. Why am I the one walking? The pot did not answer. You don't have a mouth, so I don't expect you to be able to talk," said Little Juan. "But you have three legs, so you should walk." Little Juan took the utensils out of the pot and put them on the ground. Then he climbed into the pot. "Now, pot, please carry me home," said Little Juan. The pot did not move. Little Juan sighed as he thought about what to do next. I know," he exclaimed. "Let's have a race. Even though you have three legs and I only have two, I know I will win." So little Juan ran up the hill and down the hill as fast as his legs could carry him. He never even looked back to see if the pot was close behind him. At last, little Juan arrived home. He burst through the front door. Mama! He cried out of breath. Did it beat me home? Did what beat you home, little Juan? Asked Mama. And where are the cooking pot and utensils that Abuela Carmen gave you? Little Juan told Mama about his race with the pot. Mama shook her head and sighed. Oh, little Juan, you know that you can't have a running race with a pot. It's not a real boy like you. Little Juan hung his head. "I'm sorry, Mama," he said. "What about the stew? I'm very hungry." Mama took Little Juan's hand. "Let's go down the hill together and get the pot and the utensils. We will have a very late dinner tonight." "I hope the pot is not too hungry," said Little Juan as he and his mother left the house. Mama smiled. The pot and utensils remained where Little Juan had left them. He and his mother、Cultural、collected them、festivals. up and walked home with the、What、heavy pots swinging between. What cultures do your neighbors come the- from? Celebrating the seasons, giving thanks, being with friends and family. People do all of these things during cultural festivals. Festivals are times to celebrate events or holidays that are important to different cultures around the world. People come together at a festival to enjoy delicious food, beautiful decorations, music, and dancing. Some festivals last for one day, while others last for more than a week. In some places, stores close and people stay home from school or from work to celebrate with friends and family.
People also celebrate festivals to honor important events in their culture's history. Giving gifts or eating certain foods is part of every festival around the world. People from many different cultures celebrate festivals in the United States every year. One of the most important festivals in Mexico is Cinco de Mayo. The name of this festival means 5th of May in Spanish. It celebrates the date that the Mexican army won an important battle many years ago. In the United States, people who celebrate Cinco de Mayo often march in parades and gather together to listen to mariachi music. A mariachi band has violins, trumpets, and a guitar. During Cinco de Mayo, people dance in the streets to this lively music. People often visit street fairs during Cinco de Mayo. There, they can buy traditional Mexican food, such as tacos, spicy tortilla soup, and guacamole. There are also vegetables and plenty of fresh salsa. People make special foods at home, too. Celebrating Cinco de Mayo festivals is one way that people show that they are proud of their culture. People often display the Mexican flag outside their homes on this day. In India, people celebrate a festival called Diwali, or the Festival of Lights. People celebrate this festival for different reasons. Some people celebrate an important event in India's history. Others celebrate good luck for the new year. Diwali celebrations take place in many countries in the world. People celebrate Diwali for five days. On the first day, people clean their homes. On the second day, they decorate their homes with lamps. Then, on the third day, they light the lamps and candles. At night, they watch colorful fireworks light up the sky. During the last two days of Diwali, People visit their friends and family. Together they share a feast of traditional Indian food. Another important tradition during Diwali is giving gifts to friends and family. Often these gifts are sweets or flowers made from gold and silver. People also exchange candles and clay lamps. People also celebrate Diwali by playing games with their friends or family. The winners feel lucky. If you lose, you can look forward to winning a game at next year's Diwali Festival. Tet is a celebration in Vietnam to welcome the new year. It is a joyful time when people appreciate everything that is new in their lives and in the world. To get ready for Tet, people clean and decorate their homes. They might even paint the outside so it looks fresh and clean. People also buy new clothes. On Tet, people prefer to decorate the doors of their homes with a red ribbon. They believe that the color red can keep them safe. For this reason, parents often give their children money in red envelopes. Parades and traditional dances take place on the first day of Tet. These special celebrations can continue for a week. During one Tet parade, people wear masks while they dance in the street. After the parade, Families gather together to eat traditional foods from Vietnam. These foods include fruit and sticky rice cakes. Tet is special in another way, too. Each New Year is named after a different animal. Children from Vietnam do not always say the year they were born. Instead, they might say they were born in the year of the goat. The Bundle of Sticks Based on a fable by Aesop How can these school children help to make their community better? Long ago, on a cool fall day, it was harvest time in a village in Japan. Mrs. Sato greeted her students. Class, she said, the harvest festival is in one week. We must decide how we will participate this year. Excited whispers filled the room. The whole village still talked about the mask parade from last year's festival. Mrs. Sato's class had made beautiful masks to wear in the parade. Hero raised his hand. I know what we should do, he said. Let's make paper lanterns and float them on the river. Then Yuki spoke up. 
Let's cook special dishes with plants from the harvest. More students chimed in with their ideas, but nobody could agree on just the right one. Soon everyone in the class began to quarrel. Calm down, everyone, said Mrs. Sato. All of you have good ideas, but we will never decide if we quarrel. We can work together to make the festival fun for our community. Let me show you something. Mrs. Sato left the room. She quickly returned with a bundle of sticks. The children looked at her curiously. Mrs. Sato always did surprising things. What would she do now? Look at this bundle of sticks, she said. Do you think that one of you could break one stick from this bundle? Of course I could, said Hiro. That would be easy. What about you, Yuki? Come up and try it. Yuki walked to the front of the room. Mrs. Sato took a single stick from the bundle and handed it to Yuki, who broke it in half with a snap. That was easy, wasn't it, Yuki? Mrs. Sato asked. Yuki nodded, but everyone else was confused. What was Mrs. Sato trying to tell them? Now, said Mrs. Sato, I have another question for you. Do you think that one of you could break this entire bundle of sticks? Hiro's hand popped up. I think I could do it, Mrs. Sato, he said. Okay, Hiro, Mrs. Sato said. Come up here and try. Hiro was eager to show how strong he was. He walked proudly to the front of the room. Mrs. Sato handed him the bundle of sticks. Hiro pulled, he pushed, he twisted. But no matter how hard he tried, he could not break the bundle of sticks in half. Then, one by one, the rest of the children tried to break the bundle of sticks. Each child failed. Mrs. Sato smiled at the children. This is why people in a community must work together, she said. Alone, you are like one single stick. But together, you are like a bundle of sticks. You cannot be broken. The children finally understood. They knew what they had to do. Working together, the children decided to make two projects for the festival. One group would make paper lanterns. The other group would write recipe ideas for harvest meals. Then Ken thought of an idea. We have to do something special with our bundle of sticks, he said. The class cheered in agreement. The group making lanterns used the sticks to build rafts so their lanterns could float. The group writing recipes decided to decorate their food table with leaves from the sticks. The children worked hard on their projects. Everyone smiled because there was nothing left to quarrel about. Mrs. Sato helped both groups. At the end of the day, she gathered the class together. I'm so proud of you, she said. Now that you are working together, your projects will improve the festival for the entire community. Growing Plants What things do plants need to grow? If you have ever been in a forest, you know that trees can grow taller than a house. Over many years, trees reach higher and higher toward the sky. A tree is a type of plant, and a plant is a type of living thing. Like all living things, including humans, plants need some help in order to grow. A plant can be anything from a tree or a flower to a carrot or a patch of moss. Even though plants live in different places and look different from each other, all plants require the same things to survive and to grow. Those things are food, water, air, sunlight, and space. Does all of this sound familiar? It should, because you need all of these things to grow too. We all know what it feels like to be hungry or thirsty. Plants need food and water just like people do. Plants do not chew or swallow, though. Instead, their roots simply soak up food and water from the soil around them. A plant needs to have just the right weather and soil. If a plant does not get the food and water it needs, it can die. 
A plant's roots are the twisty parts that keep it steady in the ground. Roots grow in many directions, downward and out to the sides. The roots pull food from the soil, which is another word for dirt. Plant food is made of materials that keep living things healthy. Different materials have different jobs. Some materials help the plant grow flowers and seeds. Others help the plant fight diseases. A plant uses water to move materials from its roots to all of its other parts, like the stem and the leaves. Most plants also use water to make their own food. Do you want to learn how? It's true. Plants can make some food on their own. In order to do this, they require sunlight, air, and water. Most of the action happens on the leaf. With the ingredients of light, air, and water, the leaf makes sugar. Then the plant uses the sugar to grow. Plants have a sweet tooth, just like some people do. When plants make sugar, they also give off a gas that all living things need. This gas makes up part of the air that we breathe. Now you know why trees and other plants are so important to humans and other animals. We can't live without them. When we keep forests healthy, we help the entire planet. The more plants we grow, the better our air will be. It is also important to keep smoke, garbage, and other types of harmful materials out of the air and water. This waste blocks sunlight and makes water dirty. And, as you now know, plants need good sunlight and clean air and water. Thank <laughs> you.